So what I was saying, most of us want everything to always stay the same. And if we could just, you know, just keep our lives at that one place of, of just never changing when everything was good. We call it the good old days. You know, hey, back in my day. And uh, for nothing bad to ever happen, happen. But here's the thing. Nothing good can happen if things always stay the same. If your life was to never change, that would mean nothing good would ever happen either. See, sometimes we try and shield ourselves from bad things and from painful things. But the truth is, is through the process of those bad and painful things, God shows us better things. Because we just kind of accept where, where we're at. And, you know, hey, this is good enough. And God says, no, that's, that's not good enough. You know, I, I want to do a work in you. I want to take you somewhere somewhere further. So nothing good can happen if things stay the same. And the thing is, we don't even realize things that need to change. Because we just accept our life for what it is. Hey, my life is good enough. I, things don't need to change. Um, you see this happen a lot with, with people who have been saved a really long time. Well, things are going good, God. I, I, don't, need to, I don't need to grow. Or I don't need to, Things are just good. I'm a good Christian. Just leave my life alone. And uh, we don't even realize the things that need to change. And here's, here's the real, real painful thing. We fight what's better for what's familiar. We, we, we fight what's better for us for what's familiar to us. So even though God has something bigger and, and, and better in the future, I don't want it, God, because it's not familiar. You know, we see this happen all oh. Did I do that? Did I do that? Uh, I guess I did, because I pushed a button and it came back. Must have been me, right? Uh, okay, well, anyways. Um, and we see in the book of Exodus, we see these two leaders who did this exact same thing. Now, one of them's name was Moses. He led the people of Israel. And the other's name was Pharaoh, and he, he led Egypt. Now, Moses didn't want to go lead the Israelites. He just wanted to kind of live out in the desert and do his thing. And he actually did it for 40 years before God got after him. And uh, I think that he thought he was in the clear. Typically, if you can make it under God's radar for like 40 years, typically that's like, okay, we're good. But And so Moses was probably at this point, he was probably like, you know what, I, I've made it. You know, God's not going to ask me to do anything. I'm good. And then here he is, you know, an 80-year-old man, and God's like, ha. Gotcha. You thought you were safe from me, but you weren't. <laughs> so Moses didn't want to go lead the Israelites. He just wanted to exist in the desert. And what about Pharaoh? Pharaoh didn't want to obey God, obviously. He wanted to live his own way. So that t takes us to a tale of, of, of two leaders. And we're going to look at that in Exodus chapter 3, verse 18. God won't let us stay where we are. Even if we want to, God won't let us stay where we are. God takes us where we are. When, when, God saves us wherever we are, but he doesn't leave us there. Philippians puts it like this. He who began a good work in you will see it to completion. See, God takes us where we are. When we first come to God, we have nothing to offer. We're, we're sinners and thieves and liars. We have nothing. But then something great happens. God takes us and he makes us something else. He makes us a child of God. And even though we still don't deserve it, and nothing in the course of our life as a Christian will make us deserve it, there's still some way that God takes that something of nothingness and turns it into something that glorifies him. And uh, so in Exodus chapter 3, verse 18, this is just a, a, little, a little example here. Exodus 3, 18. It says this. They will pay heed to what you say, and you with the elders of Israel will come to the king of Egypt, that's Pharaoh, and you will say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. How much did, was Moses to ask Pharaoh for? Three days. three days. A short trip into the desert. He wasn't to ask for them to let Israel go. Just for a short trip into the desert. That's it. At first. See, God all along had it in his heart to have Pharaoh let, let the people go. 
but he, you, you know that God kind of starts us off small, gives us chances, small chances to obey him before he leads us to the big things, before he leads us to the uncomfortable things. He has this little way of, it, it's like, it's like a, it's like a ramp. When you're, you know, when you're, you know, six years old and you're going up one of those itty bitty ramps, man, you really feel like you're doing something great. Well, then you get to be about 16 and that little itty bitty ramp isn't good enough for you anymore. You want the big ramp now. You want the one that goes in a, you know, a half circle. And if you look in Exodus 5, 3, it says this. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence and with sword. Okay. So now we see a little bit moving forward. Pharaoh wants to live however he wants. And God has this plan of getting him to obey. First off, he just gives him a very, very, very simple, um, gives him a very, very simple request. Three days. And then he even gives him a well-reasoned argument. And he says, you know what? Okay, what if... What if by you letting us go, we are actually going to be able to work for you as slaves even more because God won't get angry with us and we won't have disease and pestilence? Okay, well now, not only is it a small request, but now it's, in, it's all in Pharaoh's favor. Okay, this is sounding good. All right, now we look a little bit further. Exodus chapter 7, verse 10. It says this. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus... They did, just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down uh, before Pharaoh and his servant, and it became a serpent. So now we have signs and miracles happening. This, it's getting easier and easier for Pharaoh to say yes. First off, all they asked for was three days' journey. Okay. Then they said, hey, there's, this, is, this is good for you because this three-day journey will result in us not getting sick, and we'll be able to be your serves, slaves better. Well, now he, said, he shows him signs and miracles. You can know that this is from God. But Pharaoh just won't listen. And so eventually, after threatening him, God brings by these little, these little plagues just to kind of be a pain in the butt. Gnats and, and stuff like that. Just, just things that are irritating. Until finally, he leads to the place of saying, look, I'm going to kill your son if you don't let these people go. And still Pharaoh says no. Not because anything that God had done up to that point wasn't, hadn't been proven true, but just because he didn't want to let them go. So then his kid dies, and so then he tries to chase Israel down still, and he dies. See, God was constantly working in Pharaoh. We see the work that God was doing in Israel, yes, but God didn't give up on Egypt. He was working in Egypt, and so he worked and he worked, so then he brought, to, brought Pharaoh to threats, and then he brought him to discomfort and irritation, little things just kind of irritate him. And then that didn't work, so then he brought death. <coughs> and in Exodus 7, 14 through 25, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but uh, God turns the rivers of the Nile, which is the, the river, the main river that goes through Egypt, he turns it to blood. And this is the first of the plagues of Egypt, and the reason why God did it was was, was Many, I, I referenced this a few weeks ago, but uh, first off, uh, I, I know I mentioned this earlier, but there was a well-known Egyptian document that was called the Upera, uh, <laughs> Ipoware Papyrus. And uh, in it, the scribe is talking about how Egypt has been completely just destroyed and, and the gods are angry, angry with them. And a lot of the things that are in that papyrus actually happen in the book of Exodus. And then, and one of the one of the one of the things was that the Nile, uh, the water of the Nile, was turned to blood. So here we have God talking to Pharaoh in a way that he would understand. I'm bringing destruction. Just do it my way, and it'll be better for you. See, God didn't want didn't want to destroy Egypt. Just the same as he doesn't want to, to bring destruction on anyone. If you read in Lamentations, after the destruction of Jerusalem, Israel no longer has a home. And this is what the person who, who says, who just witnessed their home being destroyed. God doesn't desire to bring punishment on anybody. After he just saw God destroy his homeland and his people, that's what he had to say about it. That God does not desire to destroy anybody. I think that the saying was true hundreds of years earlier here. 
So this was a sign of impending doom, and Pharaoh just wouldn't listen. Not only that, but the Pharaoh in ancient Egypt was responsible for the livelihood of Egypt. If he was not able to do this, it was a big, a big statement that he was not really God. Because once again, the Pharaoh was responsible for this. It was his job. He was a God king. And it was his job to bring blessing on Egypt. Typically, that meant that if bad things happened, that the Pharaoh was um, a usurper. He didn't belong on the throne. And uh, the Nile, likewise, was sacred to the Egyptians. It was a source of life. So we see God not just combating the gods of Egypt, but challenging Pharaoh's claim to being a god. And doing it all in a way that the people would understand. So God gives us, uh, gives us chance for change and desires that we do change, but at the end of the day, the choice lies with us. Pharaoh continually responded to God by hardening his heart, even though, even though God started small and built on it, even though God gave time and built on it, even though God spoke in a way that he would understand, he continually hardened his heart. So, so God kept asking bigger and bigger and bigger. And what does the proverb say? The person who is prideful and, stu and stubborn and they harden their neck, eventually they're going to be destroyed beyond repair. They're going to be crushed beyond repair, and that's exactly what happened. We see Pharaoh being prideful, thinking that he is going to make it. And like I talked a few weeks ago, we have the body of this Pharaoh who was killed. The boils on his body are still there. That's a statement. That's a statement and a half that God worked, that God worked in them, and they just wouldn't believe. And, you know, I fully believe that God is still working on us today. And God allows little things to go wrong in the world. Things like global warming, things like political unrest, things like neighbor turning against neighbor. Why? To make us uncomfortable. Why? Because God wants us to repent before we are destroyed beyond repair. Before we are destroyed beyond repair. So God started small with Moses as well. First off, he had him leave Pharaoh's house. Moses did that one very, very well. Next, he asked him to talk, and Moses said, I can't do that. So, Moses, so God said, okay, your brother's going to talk on your behalf. So he sends him his brother Aaron. And then he also gives them leaders to help. And so then he talks to the leaders, and he guides the leaders, and then he has to go to Pharaoh. See, God didn't instantly have Moses go straight to Pharaoh. He gave him little people to go to. First go to your brother, then go to the Israelite leaders, then go to Pharaoh. And God does the exact same thing in us now. He, did, he, he leads us through small things to the bigger things. But if you notice, God never gave up on trying on trying to reach these people. He never gave up on Israel, he never gave up on Moses, and he never gave up on Egypt and the Pharaoh. He kept doing it even to the point of death. And while Egypt was rebuilding after, after the Exodus, they saw Israel over there just, just out of reach, where they didn't have the army to chase after them, but they could see them. That must have been infuriating. <laughs> Anyways, and then after, after, he had, after he had to face Pharaoh down and that whole nonsense, then he had the big test to lead Israel. Oh, he thought the days in Egypt were hard. Oh, little did he know. <laughs> so here we have Moses having the exact same start as Pharaoh. Leave me alone in the desert. I want to live my way. But instead, we see, we see him uh, responding with obedience after much prompting from God. Much, much, much prompting from God. <laughs> and uh, then we see him blessed while Pharaoh is cursed because of his obedience. And then we see him equipped to lead stubborn Israel by facing stubborn Pharaoh. See? See how God does that? He has us and do small things so that he can entrust us with bigger things. God knew that Israel was going to be a pain in the butt. 
So he said, okay, how about this? You're going you're gonna to face down with Pharaoh. That will prepare you for what's going down in the desert because it's not going to be fun. Um, so Moses obeyed God instead of going, doing his own thing. Um, and, and, and dealing with Pharaoh's stubbornness prepared him to, do, to deal with Israel's stubbornness. So there's just a few things that I want to point out to this before we close out. And I, I really, really genuinely hope that you think about what I'm saying. Now, remember, the title of this message is You Can't Stay Here. And this is the idea behind that. Don't harden your heart to God's lessons because God won't leave you alone. He will keep bringing by lessons and bringing by lessons and bringing by lessons. He is relentless in his pursuit to us. He will give up when we are dead. But until then, he will keep chasing us down and chasing us down. There really is no escape to God. Well, I mean, really, what are you going to do? Hide under a rock? He's going to see you there. There, there's nowhere that you can hide from God and his goodness and his love. And he just desires for you to be saved because he doesn't want you to be destroyed. See, that's groundbreaking to me because a lot of times as Christians, that's not the message that we portray to the world. We portray more of a message of you have to be like me or I won't love you. And that's not what we see God doing. We see God taking the loss for the sake of the lost. And I think that he meant us to follow suit in that. So do yourself a, a favor, grow from the trials. Do yourself a favor. I mean, really, we fight God because we want to live our own way, and then we're not happy, so we keep fighting him. Just do yourself a favor and submit your life to God. I mean, honestly. It, it's not like getting your teeth pulled. It, it's like, it's like... Before you're saved, you're thirsty, and you don't realize that you're thirsty. And then you get saved, and you realize that you're thirsty, except now you have water to drink. That's what getting, getting saved is like. You fight it, and you fight it because you think, hey, I'm better off doing life my own way. And then when your life is in shambles, and your marriage is in shambles, and your spirit is in unrest constantly, you realize, ah, I was fighting God against myself. And I'm the one who had to pick up the pieces from my own stubborn actions. See, that just doesn't make sense. If we realize the blessings and the goodness that God have, has for us, I'm convinced we wouldn't fight him so hard. And that brings me to the last little thingy here. What do you want to call that point? Little, it has a circle behind it, so. You can't stay here even if you try. If you try, your very, very hardest 